Thank you very much for having me here today. I feel very honored and privileged to be able to address you. Um, what I'm, I'm going to apologize up front. I'm on the verge of losing my voice. So those of you who know me, I'm really louder and uh, talk a lot faster and pretty much and more animated. But my husband thinks it's a good thing that I'm sick. So, <laughs> But really, um, thank you again to have me here to address such a distinguished uh, audience. Uh, really in academia, we don't have this opportunity very much, but if you think about it, really cyber is everywhere, right? So everything we do, everything we touch now has a digital component built into it, and often we don't understand the consequences of our use or misuse of it. So I was kind of thinking about this whole presentation, I'm like, well, you know, the university, we're really, really different from military, government, um, corporations. And those of you who understand the academic environment, we have people who show up all the time, want to bring all of their devices, uh, personal devices, um, probably infected. Uh, they want to connect to all of our networks and do everything anywhere all the time. And I'm thinking, you know, that's not the audience's environment, uh, right? Right? Okay, so let me just go ahead and, and talk about the University of Hawaii. So I sit at the system level, so uh, my oversight actually uh, is over all 10 campuses. We have a research university and two four-year campuses, as well as seven community colleges, and all of our research units, too, that's out on the field. So uh, we have the telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. We actually have sensors in the field. Uh, all of these things have a digital component. And now with the new federal regulations for, um, what is it, NIST 800-171 for controlled unclassified information, we now have to figure out how to protect all of these things everywhere, right, with uh, a number of technical controls around them. And then if you look at the numbers of what we have, we have at least 60,000 students, about 10,000 faculty and staff across all of our campuses. And additionally, we have groups of individuals which we really don't have control over. We call them our ohana. So if you are an alumni of the university or you retired from the university, you can keep your account forever. Okay? And that's a long time. So we have about probably about 150 active user accounts at any given time. So, um, but then I started thinking about it a little bit more, right? What's the differences? Is it really apples versus oranges with your environments and my environments? But if you think about the information security missions and goals, it really is the same. We have to protect and defend our communities and information from the people who want to get them, our adversaries. Um, as the chaplain mentioned this morning, uh, he wants to make sure that technology is used for the betterment of humans. Unfortunately, like everything else that has good associated with it, quickly people understand how to do bad with it. And unfortunately, uh, security is not built into many of the things that we use today. Um, and our cyber environments, we really are pretty similar, right? We have... Um, multiple physical locations, we have decentralized authorities, we have to work across all of these different networks and seg segments. Um, funding comes from all over the place. We have well-funded places and not so well-funded places. Um, and so really, I think we're really more alike in that respect. However, when you talk about the end user, awareness and readiness, you know, I think you folks do a much better job about ensuring that uh, your people, your communities, understand security, right? You have to have them go through some sort of indoctrination pro uh, process. They are probably um, given security cards for physical access. So all of these things, as your people come through, this is sort of being ingrained to them all the time. So as opposed to us, we just get new students coming into campus. They want to connect to our network so that they can download all of these illegal movies. Um, so from the university's perspective, you know, we have pretty fast networks. So we actually have the fastest illegal file sharing network in the state. Um, 
And to my community, security becomes a bottleneck, an impediment. They really don't want to pay any attention to security unless I call them up and I'm going, hi, you have a problem with this server with this IP. So in fact, had to do that uh, Monday, yesterday. Uh, one of our servers in our engineering network was uh, basically doing um, brute force attacks on some of our servers. So we immediately just yanked the connection from their network at the port level um, on our main network. Um, we have some of our colleagues here who, who may be familiar with that situation. But again, these people don't know. They're responsible for protecting it. They stand up these servers and services, but they just don't know or have the time or resources to be able to protect all of this. So I think that's the largest difference between our environment. So, but if you sum it all up, you know, we're not really apples and oranges. We're really a basket of fruit, right? So, um, and that's where I'm going to actually frame this presentation. Because at the end of the day, we are being attacked constantly every one of us, so your home devices, um, more so to your mobile devices, right? So there's getting vulnerabilities built into all of our devices that if we, as individual users of mobile phones, don't know that there is a patch that you need to apply to your Android phone, uh, you know, you may be responsible for propagating malware or malicious software, okay? So these are the kinds of things that we really face all the time. So again, we're fighting to communicate in a degraded environment, cyber. But really, what this means for us is we have to build in resiliency to everything we do in this cyber realm. So if we go back to the Presidential Policy Directive 21, which really talks about resilience. Again, it's the ability to prepare for and adapt to these changing conditions and be able to recover. So we know we're gonna be attacked. We know we're gonna be breached is how fast can we detect that we were attacked and breached? It's not uh, if, it is when. And so really I started thinking about this a little bit more and I think this is the cycle that we have to employ. So we have to prepare for the attacks. We're gonna have to be able to withstand the attacks, recover from them, and then we have to learn. Because as we learn about what the attackers are doing to us, trust me, they're learning about how to get around our defenses. So the adversary, they are very well funded and very well organized. And I don't think we're at that level as a community to be able to protect our cyber environments. I believe we're not at that level. And you know, events such as this is where we can raise that level of awareness as well as try to take new things back to our environments so that we can prepare, withstand, recover, and evaluate. Um, the attacks against us. So talking specifically about prepare, number one, you have to know what they're after. Know your adversary, right? And you can see this in the news all the time. So how many of you are affected by this? Yeah. Um, how many have gotten more than one letter? Probably, right? Yeah. So think about it. Why are they getting our data, right? So that's just one. And then we have attackers that you know, are, have terrorist ties. And they are using social media and our electronic networks at a rate that we just cannot keep up. And they're getting better at covering their tracks. So this is going on all the time, right? And then we have the people that just do it for the glory and claim to fame, right? Why would you break into the CIA director's personal email just to say you can, right? So obviously it's not about uh, money. It's more about the glory, right? So making a name for themselves. And then we have the people that expose vulnerabilities in systems that we as um, citizens of the United States use every day. So they didn't really break into the IRS. They used a weakness in how the system was developed to be able to get to that information. Okay. Um, and then medical records. This has been the year of breaches for medical records. So why are the attackers pursuing our medical records? Not so much credit card numbers, but medical records. All right, so Anthem, we have Primera, and then we have Care First. So this is all this year. That's a lot of medical records that were um, taken by our adversaries. And it is because the cyber criminals, those that uh, want to commoditize this information, 
realize that they can use this information longer without being detected. So how many of you will know if your child's medical records was breached, stolen by the attackers, and then was being used for medical insurance fraud? How would you even figure that out, right? So I think more of the medical companies, insurance companies are sending you statements now, right? So that you can review all of the billings that's being assessed against your insurance. Look at it. It's like your credit card statements, but really, they are able to commoditize this uh, information and use it for longer without your knowing it. And overarching, the cost of breaches is phenomenal. And they're estimating that this will actually go up. Okay, so the global um, cybercrime industry is about as big or as impactful in terms of dollars as the global drug industry. And the likelihood of being Got, uh, being caught is a little bit less right now, although um, I would say our law enforcement is doing a much better job at uh, finding these people and prosecuting them and bringing them to justice. But if you do not have a secure uh, cyber program, a cybersecurity program, if you have insurance, you can bet if, if you don't have a solid uh, program that your insurance rates will go up. Much like your cars, right? If you get into many accidents, all of a sudden your car insurance goes up. It's the same principle. Um, and again, the attackers are getting very good at bypassing our traditional defenses. So um, of all of the attacks, and this is a report from Mandian earlier this year, 100% uh, of all of the companies that they worked with had antivirus. So how many of you think antivirus is the do-all, end-all, protect you? Not a chance, not a chance. So every single one of those companies had antivirus in it. And 69% of the individuals actually did not know that they were infiltrated, did not know that somebody was in their networks. They were notified externally. And the average number of days that the attacker was in their network was 205 days without being detected. That's a long time for people to be in there getting all of your information, doing whatever they want to, dropping in all of these back doors so that they can get in even after you kick them out. And we found evidence of this at the university. So we had a compromised server in one of our departments. Uh, we prompted them, yanked them off the network. And they said they fixed it, so we put them back on the network. And promptly again, then they were recompromised. Um, it's because the attackers leave these paths back in, knowing that they will be caught. Okay. Um, and then the attack life cycle, it's, it's who. They are real people, right, that are sitting there and plotting their attacks against you. And we see this within the phishing attacks against the university. We will, for a phishing attack, we will block it or we will put up some uh, filters in our firewalls for the uh, malicious URLs. And then once the attackers know that we've blocked it, they will promptly change to a new uh, phishing URL within the same phishing run. So this is live fire. They are changing as we defend. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a tough time. It's, a, it's like whack-a-mole, but they're winning. Okay. Um, and really, again, they start generally with a phishing email, right? It's still that human component that allows them into our network. So we have people that have been compromised, their user accounts. So when they get a phishing email that asks them for their username and password because, um, you know, we want to give them more space or we're going to disable their account, they promptly give up their username and password because they don't want to lose their accounts. So um, what that happens with that is then that uh, particular account is then used later to launch additional phishing emails. And so the phishing email is the way that they start into your network and then they slowly work their way through. So it still boils down to us as humans to understand what we're doing and how it will impact the security of our environments. Um, and really, you all know this, security is as strong as the weakest link, which means that we are the weakest link. And um, really, this goes to a point where it's not that they're bad people or they, they don't um, want to do the right thing, but Case in point, we actually did an assessment against our own internal staff, and 
So I crafted a, a phishing email. And it appeared to come from our HR department. And some very, very smart and careful people actually gave up their credentials. Why? Because they were reading it on their mobile phones. They wanted to do the right thing and respond because HR said they had to. But they're reading it on these tiny little screens and, you know, gave up information that they weren't supposed to. And when I went back and talked to them, it's like, well, it didn't sound right, but it's not your traditional phishing email, so it must be true. So, you know, I just wanted to comply, right? They want to do the right thing. So, again, it's a lot of times the devices that we're reading these things on that we can't tell if it is truly a phishing attack. So, I'm just saying. Um, and again, phishing is the number one cause of most of our breaches. Okay? And then talking about our mobile devices, you know, how many of you have at least two mobile devices with you? I know you have at least one, but I bet you a lot of you have two. How many? Raise your hand if you have two. Oh, my gosh, that is a lot of you. Okay, but that goes to our times and where technology is just something that we depend on all the time. But how many of you truly understand what vulnerabilities are out there for your phones, right? So um, actually, and also understanding the capabilities of our mobile devices. We have so much computing power in that little phone that's more than when we sent uh, astronauts to the moon. Okay, that's, that's a lot of computing power to me. Um, but how many of you have Androids? Okay, how many of you patched them against stage fright? How many of you even knew what stage fright was? Okay, so just saying that a lot of times we use these devices and we truly don't know what the vulnerabilities are. Does that mean all of you need to be security professionals? I would love that. I personally would love that. But that's not what's going to happen. So what has to happen is we have to train our communities about these types of vulnerabilities. So remember, this is all still part of the preparation stage. We have to understand what kind of malware is out there, malicious software, and how it's being distributed. It doesn't just come in as an attachment on a Word document anymore or um, an Adobe Flash video. It now can come in an image, and they will hide it using a technique called steganography. Right? And so they found instances of this distribution method. Um, and then they're not just attacking our end applications. They're attacking these things in the middle, the protocols that we as computer people depend on to secure our environments. We call this SSL, or the Secure Sockets Layer. Um, so for us to actually have to defend against this, we have to know all the places that vendors are using that protocol. And so when we had the Heartbleed um, uh, and the Poodle vulnerabilities earlier, we actually had a hard time identifying all the servers that we needed to update because we didn't know where those things were embedded. So again, it's getting to the point where they're not only just attacking our endpoint devices or our servers, but that layer in between. Um, and then again, flash vulnerabilities. So every time Adobe issues a patch, please patch. Um, there are targeting methods that are being used specifically, um, in this case, targeting government agencies. Um, and again, you know, there's just so many different attacks and malware vulnerabilities out there. Really, listen to your tech people when they say patch. Please do. Um, and a lot of times people will say it's inconvenient. Um, I don't know if it'll break something. Uh, but in general, from the university's perspective, when we say patch, it means that we know that there is an imminent attack out there that will exploit the vulnerability. So we, from the security side at the university, we try not to call, cry wolf too often. But therefore, when we send something out, we really hope that our communities will listen and abide by what we tell them to do. And then we have this thing called the Internet of Things. Again, we don't know where the technology is going to be showing up. I love this. Did you hear about the Google car that was pulled over for driving too slow? And mainly just, just recently? Love it. They're going 24 miles an hour in a 35-mile zone. <laughs> yeah. But again, what happens? And they actually show that cars, these cars with this technology can be hacked. So just think, what happens if somebody gains access to your accelerator and decides or disables your brake, right? 
Um, I really like my old car that has like a key starter and none of these electronic stuff, but uh, you know, that those days are over, right? With your GPS enabled in the car, if you are being cyber stalked and you, they can actually break in and identify your, your movements based on the GPS. Um, this one is kind of interesting. Your TV may be watching you. So more and more TVs actually have some cameras built into them and microphones so that you can use them sort of like display monitors because um, you can get to all of these movie streaming services and Skype or you know, being able to use the internet to do video conferencing over it. If they can break into your TV, so I know some of you have laptops on here. How many of you have little post-it notes over your camera? Yay, awesome, thank you, I do too. And I, and I take great pleasure in showing people. They go, what is that green stuff on your laptop? It's for the camera. Um, just saying, just saying. But of course, being a security officer, I, I think I am a little bit more paranoid than most people. Um, but in this particular case, they could activate the microphone and the camera and unbeknownst to you and, and watch the things in your house. And then this is the other one, is you have all of your smartphone, uh, smart homes, your electronic sensors and cameras uh, connected to the internet so that you can watch your dog while you're at work, things like that. Um, so we actually had a case, and this was a long time ago, probably want to say maybe seven years ago, we had some cameras installed in our data center. And uh, we didn't know, but it, it had a port to the internet, and so we didn't know, so we didn't secure it. But one of our operators happened to see the camera moving one day as a pretty girl was walking down the hallway. So this camera was moving and panning to watch this, this woman. And that's when we realized that this camera had a, a connection to the internet and somebody else was controlling it, not us. Um, so again, we stumble onto these things inadvertently mostly. But if we don't know how the attackers are trying to come in or what information they want or how they distribute these things, we're going to have a hard time defending it. So to the next point, we need to withstand the attack. So I think the first point is to know when you're being attacked, right? So when Mandiant said that the attackers are in your network for 205 days undetected, that's a long time. So obviously, they're not monitoring the right things. I believe the companies are monitoring but how do you know what is that right thing? So number one, you have to be able to identify normal and abnormal activity. So university, really, really hard. So this is once um, we were detecting a spike in network usage from one of our network segments that was connected to our telescopes. Um, and so we thought they were being either hammered with a distributed denial of a service or somebody was exfiltrating large amounts of data, so we disconnected them. They were really mad at us because they were just sharing large amounts of their telescope data with another research university. So unbeknownst to us, um, yeah, we interfered with their work. So. Security was not a good thing at that moment. But what it did help us do is to go out and reach out to the departments so that we can understand the usage of the networks to help us better understand what is normal versus abnormal. And then students get really, really creative. So I once hauled this student in for doing illegal file sharing. And he said, yes, I am doing illegal file sharing. But my teacher wanted me to do research on illegal file sharing. <sighs> so I called his professor and he was obviously lying. But you know, again, these guys are very, very creative. How do we know what is actually research versus something else? Um, so the other thing we need to do is to have a good incident management procedure out there so that we can act quickly and respond to when we detect an attack. Um, so our overarching thing is, you know, being at the system level, we do have access to control the network, which is why we employ Yank and Nuke is what I call it. Um, so we build basically, if we suspect um, abnormal behavior, we will disconnect them from the network. But your procedure really needs to identify all the roles and responsibilities and identify the key players and really so that if there is a critical incident like we see exfiltration of student social security numbers going out. We know in a heartbeat who we know, need to contact and what procedures we need to employ. 
And the other thing we need to do is to make sure that you have a checklist, because it's not always we as central IT that's going to have to in investigate uh, an incident. And sometimes it's not really an incident. So we did have situations where um, we noticed that there was an intruder into one of our servers. That server had um, a large amount of sensitive information on it. Um, luckily for us, it turned out not to be an incident because we were able to determine that the directory that those files resided in were not touched. Right? So we got down to a pretty technical level in doing some of our forensics. But trust me, you really want to be able to do that to only report the actual breaches or the actual incidents. Um, really, we try really hard uh, to not have to do that. And you know, usually we're very successful because a lot of times we, we are able to catch it early on um, or that server or system really does not have sensitive information. Um, so we've been trying to do a little bit of data governance so we understand how the university sensitive information is being used, who's using it, and do they have permission to use it, and making sure they get rid of it when they no longer need it. So um, that's a very active program that's going on right now, and it's really helped us in limiting the risk to our sensitive information. Um, and then making sure that you clean up and make sure that really there are no traces left. So as I mentioned earlier, there was an instance where a server was compromised, person told me it was cleaned up, and we plugged them back into the network and saw the same compromising behavior again, and again, and again. We, we yanked this guy off the network like five times. He keeps saying his machine was cleaned off, but really things were buried in that system so deeply that he wasn't able to find it. Um, and, and that tends to be a problem for our field support teams. And then make sure that you notify all the proper people. For us, it's making sure general counsel is involved, um, our senior VPs and president knows about this so that we can get ahead of any news cycle. All of you know that the university tends to be in the crosshairs of our media. Uh, lately, it's let's see, our basketball coach, it's been a, you know, our football coach. Um, I try to keep the data and security part out of the news. I try really hard. Um, but again, you know, people are looking for bad things to broadcast. Um, and we also monitor alerts. And actually, that's something I really want to talk about to this community here in Hawaii. Hawaii, we're very unique. You know, we have to depend on ourselves collectively here um, to protect critical infrastructure, uh, to protect our way of life, um, really, right? We don't have anywhere else to, to turn to. And so in terms of sharing threat information, that's something that I think we can do as a community but it has to be a vetted, trusted community. So um, I think moving forward, some of the things we'll be talking to with our, our state partners, city and county, as well as our government, is, is to try to figure out if there's something we can do in that arena. But for the university, these are the sources that we participate in. And again, these are trusted, vetted sources. And often, you know, we may get a repository of credentials, which is usernames and passwords from a recent compromise. And we share this back with our higher education uh, partners across the, across the states and other countries um, so that they can secure their accounts in a quick manner. Um, but the point being, it has to be a vetted, trusted source. So we actually tried to do this once with a, a local financial institution. And um, the person who was sending the alerts really did not have the personal uh, relationship with that financial institution. So quickly I got a call going, hi, this person that sent me this, is, is it legitimate? Does he really work for you? And for us in Hawaii, I think that's a good thing, right? Fall back on our trust network of people that we know and that we talk to all the time. Um, but again, knowing when we're being attacked and how they're attacking us is important so that we can detect these things in our environments. Oftentimes, though, these uh, alerts come with restrictions on how we can share. A lot of times we get things at the amber at red level, which means we really cannot share it publicly unless we find a public source of the information. Um, so if we can, within Hawaii, do something similar, where we build that trusted community and can share information, uh, then I think that would be really helpful. 
So just sample, all of you guys know this is occurring. So this is just from 30 days ago um, at the university. We're getting hits on just one of our firewalls. We're going up to 4, midi, 4 million attacks um, in a time frame. And this is pretty routine. So you need to understand that what is a normal level of attacks. And uh, last year, we actually suffered a distributed denial of service attack. And our levels of attacks jumped up to like almost 200 million. So obviously, that was an anomaly. Um, and we also publish alerts to our community so they understand what new phishing attacks are coming in, um, if there's new vulnerabilities, if they have to patch, so that they can try to keep updated as to all of the security things that are going on within the university community. Um, and so for our phishing, and I'll run through an example a little bit later on, but what we do as part of the monitor and respond is that we will post notices when it's reported to us for every new phishing attack. And then that's what we actually get as it's, um, when you go back to the alerts, these are the things that we post here uh, when it's reported to us. So people, if they pay attention to that page, they will know quickly uh, when we have a new phishing attack going on. Um, we will then block the URL so that people cannot access it and give up their credentials. And we will also disable the account. So I tell people at the university, you know, if the university is asking for your credentials, really, we don't need it. We know how to disable your account so that you can have to come to see us. We don't need your password. We know how to get your attention. But people still give us their password in phishing, in phishing attacks. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is proactively disable accounts that we suspect are compromised. And we do this by watching where the logins are coming into the accounts. So if it is coming from China, if it is coming from Nigeria, we are pretty sure that that account's compromised and it will be used later. Um, so how do we recover? How do we fix everything and move forward? And mostly it's about analyzing the attack, understanding what was done, and then going through and implementing the technical controls needed to patch it. But a lot of times, it's not just technical controls, it's about policies and procedures, right? Do we need to, and actually our um, data governance program got stood up after our five data breaches in a class action lawsuit. So as you can tell, we, we do develop policy in response to particular attacks. Um, and this is something that is going to be so uh, indi individual to you and your organizations um, that I can't really drive down deep into this. So um, overarching, I really do want to talk a little bit about what we saw at the university. So we received two external notifications, and this was from another university, indicating that that university's VPN was used to connect into our network. And they were then able to um, give us IP numbers of where the attacker then went to. So we then went in, and I think we went through terabytes of web, web logs that took us probably the better part of a month to an analyze. And then we noticed that we were, had five different compromises that affected 29 websites. And this is sort of the mapping. I've sort of obliterated the actual host names on there. Um, but you can actually see how they came in. So a lot of them were WordPress uh, attacks, uh, brute force attacks on the WordPress admins. They also used SQL injections. Um, so they were, uh, the attackers knew what they were doing. And they were able to pivot through our servers and services, through our network, to be able to get as much information as they could. Um, lucky, luckily for us, none of those sites had sensitive information, largely in part to our data governance program, where we're making people report when they keep instances of sensitive information and making sure that they're approved to keep it. Um, so we're bringing a lot of awareness about how sensitive information is used and how it's maintained. 
So what we did was, again, we disabled network or directory access to those places that we had the ability to do so. And then we made the admins for those servers uh, scan for sensitive information. We wanted to verify that no sensitive information was out there. And they're also re required to scan for additional vulnerabilities. Um, and they had to change all of their passwords and patch when necessary. So again, this is a very specific example of what they had to do to remediate. And then, again, adapt and evolve, because if we don't, we know that the attackers are certainly doing that. Um, so make sure that everybody gets together in a room, gets debriefed, and understand what went on. And it's not just your particular incidents or situations. We always look at other universities' situations. So when Penn State had their breaches or um, Indiana, you know, we often talk to those support people to so understand what happened there so that we can employ appropriate remediation tactics within our environment, learning from somebody else. And that's, again, really important. If we're in a trusted environment, uh, we can share that information knowing that, you know, uh, my friend Jim out there won't, you know, publish this to the newspapers just to get a, uh, you know, put university in the headlines again. Because we all know that as we sit in this room, our intents are to protect our environment as well as to protect Hawaii. So for us, you know, with the evaluation of our web attack, we really had to modify all of the procedures. So we required that all of these servers now are registered and they have to be scanned annually. Um, and we also report them back up to their senior leadership for approval uh, to ensure that that server is authorized to be on the network doing what it's doing. Um, so for us at the university, you know, let's talk about building resiliency because it's all about going through this whole process to understand exactly what we need to do. And phishing for us at the university is huge. Every semester we have um, an influx of new phishing emails because the attackers know at the beginning of a semester that's when people are so busy that they'll just respond to these phishing emails with usernames and passwords or a click on malicious links and get infected. So the attackers know this. Um, and so we did an analysis back to last year, understood that there were 26 unique campaigns just in August and September alone. So we know that this is a, a key point, the fall semester for us. Um, and in 2014, we had a total of uh, 281 compromised accounts. As opposed to this year, through October, we already have 1,754 accounts. So that's a huge spike for us. So obviously, they want our credentials and know how to get it from us. Um, and additionally, though, we're finding out uh, how they come into us and how they pivot to, through the university using our information. So we did an analysis and we're able to determine that um, most of the fraudulent phishing emails come in from Nigeria, no, no surprise there. Um, and, but what's interesting is you notice Florida has 13% of them. So they are now understanding that we as a university know that we're looking for Nigeria as the source of these phishing emails. So now they're compromising other universities and then sending the phishing emails from U.S. accounts, servers, or networks. So they're bypassing. So they're figuring out what we know and are now bypassing that for us. Um, and then the other thing we did was we actually did an analysis on the phishing attacks themselves. So we were able to determine that on average, the phisher, the attacker, once they got the credentials, they didn't use it right away. They waited for about seven days or more before they started using that compromised account. Why is that? Because the users forget what they did a week ago. So when we go back and ask somebody, your account was compromised, do you remember how you got compromised? Did you respond to a phishing email? They're like, I don't know, I don't remember. Oh, a week's a long time ago for people, right? Um, and then they don't send a whole lot of emails, they just send 20 emails per account, but it's BCC'd to over 50 recipients. So one email run will compromise, um, let's say about a thousand other accounts perhaps. Um, and then they delete the emails from the sent folder. So the user is still using their accounts and they don't know that the attacker was in there using it also. Okay? So they're getting very crafty. So of course we have to train our end user community 
to understand what a phishing attack is and how to report it. Um, and then, we, so we actually came up with this. It's called Sear the Fish. I have to admit our students was a little bit creative. Stop, examine, ask, and report. So that's our campaign for phishing. And we use it. So that was last year, and we still use it this year. So that's part of our evaluate phase, where we're doing an analysis on all the compromised accounts. So I think right now we're getting a little bit ahead of the curve, although I know that we've had another run in November. So I have to go back and do some analysis on that. Um, but really, at the bottom line, it's about prepare, withstand, recover, and evaluate, always. And we're going to be in this lather, rinse, repeat cycle forever. Okay. Now, specifically for Hawaii, some of our unique challenges. You know, I talked about our location and our isolation. Um, and really, because we're an island state, 98% of all of our imported goods comes in through our ports. So we're going back now to critical infrastructure, right? So we need to secure our ports. But because the ports are largely um, managed and operated by private sector, how do we ensure that all of those private companies you know, talk together? So the Coast Guard actually has put together the Area Maritime Security Committee um, to pull all of these entities together to um, address this. And so this is why earlier we ran the Coast Guard cybersecurity exercise to pull all of their technical people. We did a live fire cyber range exercise, and afterwards the leadership of those companies then sat in a tabletop environment to talk about all of the challenges within this cyber realm um, and how will they be able to negotiate and navigate through this new cyber environment. Again, we just think of it as being there, and the problem is that we don't understand all of the risks and vulnerabilities within our environments. The other main thing for us is that we have a limited pool of cyber and cybersecurity professionals on island. People who graduate with this, these degrees here from the University of Hawaii, they go away and they get really high paying jobs. But a lot of times the people really miss Hawaii and the lifestyle that we have here. So within um, the university, we're starting to uh, develop what we're calling pathways with a purpose in cybersecurity so that we can put all of the different programs together so that students will be able to understand that they can go to Honolulu Community College for a networking two-year degree um, and then follow up into UH West Oahu for a bachelor's of a applied science in information assurance and security. So we're trying to do this with all of the campuses, and we have a number of different grants. So um, in the future, we're actually going to be rolling out this um, initiative called Pathways with a Purpose. So um, just to pitch that right now, and um, we're reaching out to a lot of you, because also the other thing we want to do is to ensure that we work with our partners here to ensure that these people have jobs um, when they graduate. So we're just coming off October being National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, October, and this is a national initiative. And really what highlights here is it's our shared responsibility. So all of us in this room um, has to go out and embrace security as integral to all of the things that we do in our daily jobs. So it's not security as a professional, but you know, think about security as you go through your daily lives, in fact. So it, it also goes back into your personal lives. Um, so touching a little bit on the need for professionals, both in cyber and security. Um, again, because we're putting together uh, the program, we need to evaluate the job market globally as well as here in Hawaii. So these slides are mostly about globally. Um, and they're anticipating that there'll be 200 billion Internet of Things um, that will have some network component in it. Now, for the life of me, I do not understand why my refrigerator needs to be connected to the Internet. So I think there are places in it that, you know, just don't make sense. Um, but for other things, it really does. Um, so according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you know, there are 1.4 million additional IT jobs. Um, and we only have 400,000 computer science graduates. So those of you who have children in school now, point them this way, okay? Um, and, and the thing that we're understanding now that is students as young as elementary school need to understand that they have to um, take science and math 
or be excited about science and math. So we want to engage with our K-12 community early and often so that we can uh, stimulate our youth to pursue career fields in this area. Um, tech sector uh, unemployment was extremely low. I mean, that, that's really pretty incredible. Um, and then these are all the different initiatives that we're working on right now. So again, talked a little bit about the pathways with a purpose throughout the University of Hawaii system. Um, we have a cybersecurity workforce de development initiative where we actually got some federal funding for some of these programs. So we received a $10 million grant from the Department of Labor for our community colleges for them to stand up two-year programs on all of our seven community college programs. And so what we're doing with that is then stitching it back to the University of Hawaii West Oahu, the University of Hawaii Manoa, so that if the students want to pursue four-year degrees, they have the opportunity to do so without losing time or credits. Um, and there is a new program <clears throat> at the Pacific uh, Center for Acad uh, Advanced Technology and Training called the IT Apprenticeship. So we actually will be reaching out. So Steve Arabach uh, is the director of PCAT, and he just recently announced that they received this, this funding. And then the University of West Oahu, under the leadership of Dr. Matt Chapman, has stood up their Bachelors of Applied Science in Information, uh, Information Security and Assurance. Um, two schools that have gotten certified by NSA as Centers of Academic Excellence, Honolulu Community College as a two-year, um, and UH Manoa as a Center for Research, and some of our other four years and two years are also pursuing being certified. So what this does is it gives a level of assurance that the courses that we are delivering through these programs actually meet NSA standards. Um, and so to us, that, that's huge. And to get the students interested, we are embarking with the NSA again this year for these gen cyber camps to uh, interest high school students in cybersecurity. So we ran the program last year, and one of our success stories is um, one of the students, a female, uh, she was a junior at the time, and she came to the camp and went back in fall and was addressing the Parent Teachers Association. And she stood up in front of that audience and said, you know, I didn't know what cybersecurity was, but I went to this gen cyber uh, camp this summer and I wanna be a cryptologist. I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so we will be doing this again uh, this coming year. So mainly is we also need to engage with all of you to ensure that we provide partnerships and opportunities to the students. And also for you, if you have employees that need or want to come back for additional training. Um, so most of it is in our early discussions, but what we really want to do is to be able to map all of the frameworks. So from the jobs, if the jobs are mapped to uh, cybersecurity frameworks and we align our curriculum, you know that the students you are hiring will be matched for your jobs. So that's some of the things that's currently in, in uh, in works right now. So I think that's it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that one, I was able to uh, spur some thinking around the cybersecurity environments, your environments, my environments, and how do we address the future with all of our professionals. So thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs> So will, any questions? Ma'am, the first oh. question, do you see technology solutions working in the right areas or are we simply correcting old problems and falling further behind? Excellent question. Um, I believe that technology is actually moving in the right direction. But for every good thing we do with technology, Trust me, the bad guys are out there also finding uses for that technology. So are we falling further behind? I'm going to couch that. I don't think we're falling further behind. I think the delta behind the bad guys on us is actually slowly closing the gap. But we are still behind. Um, and the only way we're going to get ahead of the curve is, one, educate everyone, educate our youth, get more professionals involved. Um, also, I will push this out to our development community out here. 
Build secure apps, build secure protocols, build secure operating system. I should not have to patch my Microsoft operating system every Tuesday, right? Patch Tuesday. Um, and, and it's hard because that's not an environment that we as programmers grew up in. So I come from a computer science background. Nobody told me that when I program, I need to ensure that the buffer overflow could not be used to inject bad things into my application, right? So it's a whole shift in thinking all the way back down to the development stage. So thank you. Did that ask the question, answer the question? Any other questions? Oh, we last have time one. for one more. One more, last one. What do you think are the top three threats to users of the internet, and how are these threats minimized? Top three? I would just say it's a personal awareness. Again, going back to that human component, how do you know when you're being fished? How do you know um, when there's an attack? And all of that comes from user awareness. So we, as employers and educators, we need to do a better job of educating people um, and additionally is understanding how all of the things that we use today, what are the security risks involved with that? So again, I still go back to it's an understanding of risks and technology and how it impacts our environments. And, and third, it really is understanding our adversaries. What are their motivations and why are they trying to use it against us? And, the, the motivations are many, and they're coming in from many different segments. Some is for um, to make money, right? A cyber crime, financial fraud. Others is just about terrorist activities and using it as communications mechanisms. Um, and again, how are the threats minimized? Again, I, I strongly believe it's going back to education. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, time's up, and I look forward to meeting with more of you later on. <laughs>